Hello everybody, um, I really hope you're enjoying your ecological niche modelling course so far. I today am going to look at transferability with you and give you an introduction into the transferability of ecological niche models. So what are we going to look at? Well, we're going to look at what transferability is. We're going to look at why we might want to transfer models. And in fact, we do this all the time. Um, we are transferring models all the time. So why are we doing it? Why do we need to do it? the factors that can affect the transferability of those models and a few things for you to keep in mind if you're going to go forwards and try and build models for transfer um, what might you need to think about now this is a massive field so this will be an introduction and some guidance to further reading and things to consider you'll also obviously going to be get a lot of other talks on model transferability that hopefully will add to this introductory talk so what is model transferability? It is the predictive capacity of a model in a novel environment. And by novel environment, I mean not the place or point in time in which you made it. So you make a model in one environment, your reference environment, and then you use it to predict to a new, another new environment, and that is your target. So for example, you might know where a species occurs in one area or in one country, you have good response information. So where that species is, you have good samples for where that species is, and you have good information on the predictors of that species. So the environmental predictors, so you know both the response and the predictors for that species. But there is another place where you want to know where that species is, but you have no response data. So you might make a spatial transfer. You might predict based on the model that you made in your reference area where you have good knowledge to the place where you have little or no knowledge of the distribution of your species. Now, a temporal transfer does the same thing in time. So you make a prediction, either hindcasting or forecasting, um, based on future or past information on the predictors. So why might we want to transfer models? In fact, we need to transfer models all the time. A lot of the time we don't actually have the sufficient data to, to make custom models to understand the distribution of species. This is particularly true in the marine environment, the vast majority of which has not been sampled. Um, but even in terrestrial and aquatic environments, there are a lot of data deficiencies. And yet we still need to support resource, resource management, such as guide the design of protected areas, inform where we may want to do reintroduction. So we know that a species used to live in the UK, for example, but now it's only found on mainland Europe. So we might make a model of its distribution in mainland Europe and use that to predict the best places to reintroduce. Now, there are issues, obviously, we'll get to those, um, but it starts to give us an idea of where we might target that management. We can also use to design field sampling campaigns. So if we don't know where a species is, we have no response data for a species in a particular area, but we expect that it might be there. We can build a model for another area, predict into the area we have no response information, and then use that to guide how we do our sampling to look for whether our predictions are correct. We might want to predict change under future or past under future scenarios or in past environments. So for example, we do this all the time in terms of forecasting species responses to climate warming, trying to guess how things are going to move and be affected by the changing climate. We also might want to predict risk, extent and spread of invasive species. We know this is a major problem in conservation and resource management. And we can use transfers from the places these species currently exist to understand where they might be going or which habitats they might be able to occupy. Um, and an example of this would be projections of the Asian tiger mosquito, which has huge implications for human health and they made distribution models onto all continents to identify areas of greatest risk for invasion and therefore target appropriate management.
Now, as we say, we often don't have sufficient data or it's impossible to collect data in the, in the case of forecasting or predicting under future climate scenarios. But sometimes we do. So sometimes we have data rich model transfer scenarios where we have data for both the response variable and the predictive variables at both the reference and target site. So here what you're actually doing is validating transfer predictions directly. You're building a model in one place or point in time and predicting it somewhere else where you can actually measure its predictive performance. And this kind of study is used to understand the factors that affect model transferability. And they make up a large proportion of the literature. In other cases, you are data sparse. So maybe you have data for the response um, sorry, maybe you have data for the predictors, or at least a sufficient subset of the predictors, but you don't have data for the response. So in this case, you can transfer. You have the predictor variables to enable you to transfer the response predictor relationship, but you cannot validate your transfer. You cannot measure the, the, the predictive performance directly. So where possible, if you can, you should test that model transferability to another similar site, so similar in terms of relationships with the covariates. And this would be a site where you have, again, both the response and predict data. So you'd be doing a data rich transfer before you did your data sparse transfer. And that would enable you to have a bit more confidence in your predictions into your data sparse target area. Sometimes you're completely data deficient, so you have insufficient or no data for either the response and predictors, and obviously this poses more challenges. You can investigate alternative data sources, such as using expert knowledge um, to guesstimate where species might occur, or look at predicting the missing predictors, maybe using something like Bayesian approaches. So when you have those data rich scenarios, you can actually assess directly the predictive performance or the transferability of your model. And what we found is that transferability is highly variable um, and lots of studies have been looking into what affects model transferability. In this figure from a 2018 paper, 20 different studies were looked at um, and it was became quite apparent that transferability is not necessarily anything to do with proximity um, in terms of geographic location or even temporal proximity and there's actually lots of other factors that affect transferability. You can see in this figure the 20 studies um, the reference site so the site where the model was built is the solid circle green is for good transfer um, the orangey brown is limited or poor and when you have both colours then it varies. Some studies look for example at different model types um, then it varies and you can see that actually studies that are quite far apart in terms of reference and target can transfer very well and studies that are very close can transfer very badly and that the reverse is true. So we know transferability is variable and we know that it's not necessarily anything to do with geographic or temporal proximity and in fact there's lots of other things that affect model transfers. So now I'd like you to think about what might affect the predictive performance of a, mo of a transferred model. I want you to think about everything you've learned so far in terms of your ecological niche modelling course and try and consider the factors or the different contexts or circumstances that would mean that a model created in one environment would or would not transfer well when used to make predictions somewhere else, either a point in time or a point in space. So grab a pen, uh, paper, um, and start making some notes. Pause this um, presentation, write some things down, and then come back to me. So there are lots of things, hopefully, that you wrote down. Um, lots of things that potentially will affect predictive performance. We're going to talk about some of them. So obviously one is the quality and resolution of the predictors. 
and this can affect how well you capture relevant ecological processes and detect local variations that would affect your response variable. So how well you can actually predict where your response is. Another is sample size. So large sample size generally captures variability in a habitat better and allows more precise estimates of model parameters. The model fit, so how well you have fit your model and if importantly you have overfit your model, which can lead to incorrect inferences. So overfitting your model normally would make it less transferable. It's too tight to the um, response and predictor information in your reference site. Ecological traits. Some species are potentially much more difficult to build transferable models for, particularly those, for example, that are behaviorally plastic, so they can adapt. They may be dependent on a certain set of circumstances in the air in your reference area where you've collected your data, but actually they can change their behavior, they can change their foraging or the environments in which they live if they need to. And so when you try and predict the target area, you get it completely wrong. But there are lots of others, model complexity, um, model algorithm, the biotic interactions, data sampling, design. There are huge amounts of things that, protect, that affect your predictive performance of a transferred model. And thankfully, a really good review of factors that affect predictive performance can be found in a paper by Sekira in um, 2018. And there was an extensive literature review done and they've listed a lot of the factors that affect model transfers and the way in which they affect them. So the things that can have a positive effect on your predictive performance, a variable effect and a negative effect. I highly recommend that you have a look at that paper. So what really matters in terms of your predictive performance of your model is its ability to characterize the niche um, of the species that you're interested in predicting to understand that niche. Now, to remind you, I'm sure you're aware, but to remind you the difference between a fundamental niche and the realized niche. So the fundamental niche being the full range of environmental conditions that a species can occupy and use, and the realized niche being where it actually is as a result of other limiting factors present in the habitat. Now, in theory, your transferability should be greater in models fitted to observations that document all dimensions and there are the constraints upon the fundamental niche. So understanding everywhere your species can be. However, most data sets will fall short of meeting that. I mean, organisms don't always actually occupy all suitable habitats or conversely, sometimes will occupy unsuitable ones for periods of time either as a result of dispersal barriers, anthropogenic disturbance, maybe biotic exclusions because of competition or parasitism, or simply because the all potential habitats they could occupy might not currently exist. So we don't have that data. And even if we did have that data, it might not help because the realized niche, where they actually are now, which is what you're trying to predict, is often restricted in comparison to the fundamental niche. So even a perfect understanding of the fundamental niche wouldn't make necessarily for correct predictions now at this point in time or space. Also, while well, your fundamental niche can be expected to stay consistent over timescales relevant to management, so daily to decadal, realized niches will typically vary both spatially and temporally. So where things actually are will vary much shorter timescales than your fundamental niche. And one of the things that you need to really worry about um, when you're making transfers, when you're predicting and trying to understand where you might find species, either spatially or temporally, is non-stationarity. Because model transfers rely on this inherent premise 
that species environmental relationships are stationary at the reference site, so that's where the model was developed, and that they remain so beyond it, so within your target area. But actually, species response to the environment are rarely static. They can vary non-linearly non with resource availability, population density, and a host of other things. Indeed, those species environment relationships are context specific and where species occur will ultimately depend on where suitable habitat occurs and the relative availability of that habitat. Where species will occur also strongly depends on whether other species occur and those interactions are fundamental for forming part of the, the realised niche. Indeed, the strong evidence for the role of bot interactions in shaping species ranges at large spatial scales. So if you have uh, a species occurring within your target area, so where you're wanting to transfer to, that doesn't occur within your predicted, within your reference area where you're developing your models, and that species might interact with the response you're interested in, so the species that you're interested in, then you, that interaction can completely change the realised needs of the species and, their species and therefore your transfer could fail or could predict poorly. Anthropogenic activities can also have strong influence on species distribution, both past and present, and these activities themselves highly variable in time and space. Often disentangling anthropogenic impacts from environmentally driven covariance is really difficult, especially as our history of human exposure, our exploitation is often unknown, or at the very least, the magnitude of the impacts is unknown or unobservable. A common challenge when transferring models is dealing with non-analog conditions. So these are novel environmental conditions. This can be extrapolation, which I think you've dealt with before so far in this course, but extrapolation is predictions beyond the range of your predictor variables, so extending the curve. Or it could be novel combinations of environmental predictors. So that, for example, would be still within the range of your predictor variables in your reference site, but new combinations of those predictors in your target area. Now, transferring models into these non-analog conditions brings numerous and well-documented perils. Even small amounts of extrapolation can sometimes lead to very poor predictions or very big amounts of error in your predictions. Different techniques to account for these non-analog conditions will be required depending on the degree of environmental dissimilarity, so how novel the conditions are, if they're just a little above the observed or completely dissimilar. And one thing that you must do, must consider, is how to visualise regions whose characteristics depart from the initial covariate range. So, for example, if you look at some of the, the figure below, this is work by Zoll um, and Co in 2012, and it allows you to see how your predicted occurrences are distributed in terms of sampled environmental space and novel environmental space, which can help assess the potential impacts of non-analog conditions on your predicted performance. And is really important for starting to communicate uncertainty in your predictions. However, these tools cannot actually predict the species response to the novel conditions. And these responses can be strong and particularly unexpected if the change in environmental conditions imposes different selection pressures. Maybe it could disrupt biotic interactions such as predator prey interactions or mutualistic interactions. And it could also cause communities to evolve in unexpected ways. One of the things you might be thinking or might be wondering is, well, OK, so where do I start? Which model algorithm is the best if I want to transfer? Lots of studies have explored this and tested lots of different model algorithms in data rich scenarios to try and determine which is best. And the reality is so far, all we can say is it depends. 
sometimes random forest and boosted regression trees, two data-driven approaches that are relatively immune to overfitting, have been shown to demonstrate really high performance. But at other times, Maxent has been shown as the most transferable, and even general linear models, which have potential for generating unrealistic predictions outside the training scope, they have been sometimes identified as very robust choices for transfers. Different pro approaches in model tuning and data treatment will contribute to this heterogeneity and, and ultimately there will not be a one-size-fits-all and a lot of studies will test several different model algorithms. One thing that is less uh, debated is that excessively complex models can prove to be difficult in terms of transferability. Models that overfit training data, so overfit the data in the reference area, can then attribute erroneously patterns to sampling or environmental noise, which can lead to predictions in your target area that are too biased or too specific to the reference system to actually be transferable. So they're too tight to that area where you have developed your model and therefore don't make good predictions for you elsewhere. So then generally we expect greater transferability with parsimonious models, so models that are as simple as possible um, with smooth univariate response curves and not many predictors. But even simple models can lead to misleading predictions when transferred into new contexts. Simplicity is not always beneficial, sometimes complexity is necessary. And in, in the end, ultimately, simple and complex models will serve different purposes. Complex models could be useful in exploring some nonlinear and dynamic associations of species. So when we talked about biotic interactions, for example, which could be really important for um, defining the realized niche of a species, they could be captured in more complex models and therefore lead to greater transferability. Choosing the optimal complexity of a model requires identifying actually the most sensible predictors relative to a given study objective. There is no substitute for understanding your, the species, the ecology of the species that you're trying to predict. So model transfers. They have huge potential benefit for informing resource management and helping us to predict where species may occur in data poor environments or in future environments, which we obviously can't sample. There is a large and very rapidly growing body of literature on model transfers, which often uses data rich scenarios. So where we understand have response data in both the reference and target site to try and explore the factors that affect the transferability of models. And we've touched on some of those factors today. Developing models for transfer requires all of the same best practice as for model development, but with some additional considerations, things like non-stationarity and non-analog conditions. There are lots of reasons why transfers might predict poorly. And when considering developing models for transfer, it's important to think about the mechanisms that affect the distribution of a species, as well as just the statistical relationships between the predictors and the response variables. Now I've given you a very brief introduction into what is a massive topic. Um, and to give you that introduction, I've relied heavily on two particular articles. This one in Methods in Ecology and Evolution, um, written by, led by Anna Sakira, and it looks at the challenges and opportunities of model transfers. It does a really good job of reviewing a large body of literature, and that's where the table came from on the factors that affect transferability. And it also gives a schematic about what kind of transfer scenarios you might be in in terms of the data that you have, and I would highly recommend that. 
And then the other place to start, I would suggest, is the uh, summary in Tree and the Outstanding Challenges in the Transferability of Ecological Models. It again summarizes a large body of literature, but it also shows you how the different challenges, things like non-analog conditions, actually fit into your modeling workflow as you're developing models. And both of those papers have really extensive reference lists that will give you an in into this very large field um, of literature. The references um, cited in the previous slides can be found here in the reference list. And all that leaves is for me to say many thanks for your attention. I hope that you found this useful. Um, and I'd like very much to thank my two colleagues, um, Dr. Phil Boucher and Dr. Anna Sekira, with a, without whom I would never have started this foray into model transferability. They both do very interesting work. And you can see you've got their Twitter handles there. You can follow them on Twitter if you want to see what they're up to. For example, uh, Phil has recently developed at all for exploring how much you are extrapolating with your models and, and that may help you um, understand the extent that you are going into non-analog conditions. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing your questions.